Okay, so he was talking about changing ATP to ADP. We release energy when we do that. Um, he talked about the um, structure of ATP. You had your, ad, your um, adenine nucleic acid, your nitrogen base here, the ribose sugar, the three phosphate groups, and that's why it's tri, one, two, three. Okay, he talked about different energy conversions, um, and he talked about, um, we have catabolic reactions that break things down, anabolic reactions that build things up. And I'll link this video in if you guys want to, um, to watch it later with actual pictures, metabolism, the sum total of all chemical reactions. I'm gonna hit all those concepts in today's um, lecture anyways. So shoot, but we'll be okay. Um, in the Google Classroom, under the Zoom, we have two things we're going to accomplish today on your end. So go to the Google Classroom and go to week 11, and you will find thermodynamics. I can't believe I messed that up. So thermodynamics 8.1 Friday Zoom. The first thing I want you to do is open up this ATP worksheet. So there are two worksheets that should be attached. It's jumping around a bit. Um, there it is. Okay, so grab that ATP worksheet. This is actually the third time we're introducing ATP. We talked about it during nucleic acids, um, the macromolecules. We talked about it um, during our discussion of active transport and the pumps, okay? So see if you can't take five minutes. It's probably not even five minutes. Let's try three minutes maybe. Take a handful of minutes, see if you can't um, fill this out and then we'll go over it together. Today's lesson is more learn by doing rather than me just giving information to you. We're gonna kind of discover what you know and talk about that. Um, if you could open up real quick, we're about to go over this worksheet. So in um, week 11, you'll find um, thermodynamics, 8.1 thermodynamics zoom. So open up the ATP worksheet. Okay, so we're ready to go over that worksheet. Review of AT, Ooh. okay, so um, this molecule you should have identified as ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So the question is, which letter represents the five carbon molecule or monosaccharide? So five carbons, five-sided, object makes a pentagon. So even if you didn't know that that was the sugar, you might have guessed based on the fact that it has five sides. So this is ribose, letter B. Adenine is our nitrogenous base. Remember during um, nucleic acids, we talked about adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine. So here, the double rings in yellow, A is our adenine. And then um, letter number four, which letter represents the bond that will be broken? So these are our phosphates. So we really have to choose between D and E. And hopefully it makes sense that it's easier to break off the end piece than it is to break off a middle piece, right? So letter E will break and release a phosphate and at the same time release energy. So we saw that last chapter when we talked about um, the sodium potassium pump, right? We broke off a phosphate, released energy. So we don't leave chapters behind, we keep building off of them. So when one of these phosphates break off, you have what's called a DP diphosphate, because it only has two. The third bond can break, in which case you would have a MP, adenosine monophosphate. So for the most part, you're cycling between ATP and ADP. So you break it, use the energy, and then recycle the phosphate and you make it again. So you just keep going back and forth between ATP and ADP. So the letters that represent the phosphates are C, 
the three blue circles are all phosphate molecules. So, um, I answered this wrong last time. I didn't read my question correctly. So order the statements to describe how ATP is utilized by the cell. So um, I think you have to start with let number three. Energy phosphate is broken off of ATP, which allows energy to be released. Number two. At this point, ATP has become ADP, number five. Number four, the ADP then rejoins its phosphate to become ATP, number one. So I did not sequence that last time. I read it wrong. So, the high energy phosphate bond is broken. So I'm going three, two, five, I don't know, two, five, interchangeable really. Um, four, one was the sequence I did. Okay, so hold on to that one. We got one more activity we're gonna do before we turn this, this one in. Um, linked to that same 8.1. Let's pull up our, our uh, agenda actually. So we just completed our bell work. We're going to get out, we are going to go through a Nearpod interactive PowerPoint um, related to thermodynamics. So section 8.1 in your book is therm thermodynamics. And really the whole purpose of this is to surface schema. Schema is what you already know about something. So it's what concept you have. Um, and in the same, at the same time, we're introducing vocabulary. This is going to be very important for us to move forward in the next section of the chapter, okay? In class, we are going to complete our vocabulary before we release for the weekend. And those of you who owe me a quiz, I think I have five of you. Um, those of you who owe me a quiz, we can make up our quiz at that time. And then you will still have an hour left reading um, section 8.2. The chapter is attached to this, um, to the Google Classroom um, and taking notes over that section. So this section is a process. Vocabulary we're already gonna do, right? So you don't need to spend time defining bold face words as your notes. We saw over and over again on our tests and quizzes. It's not so much about defining vocabulary, but it's about using the vocabulary. So anytime you have a process, you wanna be able to explain the process, right? Identify examples of different terms. Um, look for connections between concepts. So when you're taking your notes, you wanna look for more usable information in that sense, okay? I'm going to have you guys work in groups today, but I'm not going to assign them according to a random. I'd like you to PM me. I guess I wrote this on a different one. PM me who you would like to work with, and I will try to create groups where you are with your buddies rather than with miscellaneous individuals. Okay. So I'll open my chat box so that I can start accumulating a list of who would like to work with who for our last activity. <clears throat> okay, so I see the list is starting to be created. So this is the last thing we'll do today is the groups. Um, that'll give me time to put your groups together because it's a little, it takes a little bit more time when we do it this way than if I do a random sort. Okay. Once you got your term, um, I want you to go to the um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm thinking about starting a new live session to just to make sure there's room for everybody. Did you already join the other one? Okay.
So I'm going to put a new link in the um, chat box here. Since 20 people are already in the other one, I want to make sure you have, there's room for everybody. So go ahead and join me in this Zoom. I'm sorry, in this Nearpod. Wow, I was so good for that hour and I saved my recording for this hour. Now I'm like messing up all over the place. Okay, the chat box is filling up with friends. The Nearpod has been opened. Let's see that list of people grow. It shows me seven people in the Nearpod. We have 16 people, 15 people in the class. Let's try to get some more people. Currently it shows me only, okay, 12 people are in, 13 people are in, still 13 people. We should have 15. If I could get two more, that'd be fabulous. I'm gonna refresh my screen in case I just, Okay, so like I said before, we have a discussion of thermodynamics today, and that's the video was just giving an introduction of that. And the whole concept of thermodynamics is that it's the study of energy conversions um, within a system. Okay, so whether it's within an organism, a cell, an ecosystem, a food chain, any of that, you're studying thermodynamics. Okay, so 8.2 is photosynthesis, 8.3 cellular respiration. Those are big energy conversion processes, right? So we need a good understanding of vocabulary, and that is our goal for today's lesson. So here's your first question. You're gonna kind of lead me through this lesson today. What do you think of when you hear the word energy? What do you think of when you hear the word energy? Movement, food, eating carbs, kinetic energy, a, a few of the movements, a few for food. Food and movement, most common. Strength and power, types of energy like kinetic and thermal. So somebody is ready for our next question, really. Okay. So again, we're surfacing schema, right? So that's what you'd think of when you hear the word energy. Energy, by definition, is the ability to do work. So a lot of you said movement. That has to do with move uh, work. So now we're looking for forms of energy, different forms of energy. What have you talked about in prior classes? Surfacing schema is basically surfacing your prior knowledge. What is your understanding of a concept? What are your thoughts? If we're from different areas, we might have different concepts. Sound energy, I haven't heard that one yet. Thermal, kinetic, I hear a lot of kinetic potential, elastic, I think that comes from a lot of our physical science background. Chemical energy, mm -hmm, which is actually a form of potential energy because it's stored energy. Sound and light, light is a new form of energy, yes. Gravitational potential energy, yes, energy of positions, good job. Okay, so a lot of kinetic energy, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Um, potential energy is the energy of like stored energy, but then even those, those kinetic or potential energies come in many forms, right? So they come in the form of chemical bonds or they come in the form of light waves, um, heat waves, sound waves. Um, water, I'm not sure I saw water, hydroelectric, the energy that is stored in organisms. Um, solar energy, electricity, thermal energy. You guys got those wind energy. I'm not sure if we had wind. So you guys hit a lot of the examples that I had. You had a, a broader range, I would say, than the last class. So here we go, summing it up. By definition, energy is the ability to do work. Okay, here's a key concept. We've mentioned this a couple of times. So I would expect to see this on your test. I may even expect to see this on your final exam. Energy is stored in chemical bonds, right? Chemical bonds are sharing of electrons. The electrons are the energy source. So if you have a bond, energy is stored up, it's potential, ready to be used later. Once you break that bond, energy is released. 
So energy is stored when bonds are formed. Energy is released when bonds are broken. Key concept. When we make glucose, we're storing energy in the form of bonds. When we break glucose down, we're breaking bonds, and so we're releasing energy. So these are energy conversions. That slide I mean to get rid of because I turned them into near pod slides. So what are some examples of energy conversions that you can think of? You're converting what into what? You're changing one form of energy into another form of energy, okay? So a lot of potentials to kinetic makes sense. We're taking a stored energy and we're changing it into um, usable energy. We got kinetic to elastic, kinetic to thermal, good. Elastic to kinetic, gravitational to kinetic, when the rock goes down the hill, common example. Electricity to light, good. Chemical to mechanical. So when we break down food and then we use that energy to move our muscles, that's gonna be chemical to mechanical. Um, let's see, thermal and sound, yeah. The movement can produce sound waves itself. That's a good example. Um, and then light and light, great, good job. Okay, so like I said earlier, um, thermodynamics is the study of the flow of energy transformations. So any of those examples that you just gave me would fall under the study of thermodynamics. So you're, you're studying how that movement of energy goes. There's two basic laws that we study. One, the first law of thermodynamics is conservation. So if you're conserving, you're not losing, right? So the law of conservation, energy is neither created nor destroyed, only changed in form. So you see that conservation in a couple other places. You, you have conservation of momentum, conservation of mass, right? Neither created nor destroyed, only changed in form. The second law of therm thermodynamics is when you make one of those energy changes, you lose some usable energy. So this is the law of entropy. Entropy is disorder. You guys spend a lot of time and energy in making or cleaning your room, right? Your mom says you gotta clean your room before you can go out. So you clean your room, you spend all day doing that, and the very next day, boom, it's a mess, like in an hour, right? So the universe tends towards disorder. A molecule as a whole piece is orderly. The universe tends to break that molecule apart releasing energy. So the law of entropy has to do with disorder and loss of usable energy. And we will define them both here in a second. So here's your first law. This is a memorizable fact, which means it's a testable fact. The law of conservation of energy literally states energy can be neither created nor destroyed, only changed in form. So you're not gonna come up with energy out of nowhere. This frictional force here has to have mechanical energy behind it. That mechanical energy needs to be powered by chemical energy, right? So there's a conversion. The solar energy gives energies to the plant and they'll use it to store it in the form of organic molecules like glucose. A lot of that energy is gonna be lost to the atmosphere or environment as heat, that's our second law. The energy from one plant or organism is converted to another plant or organism, right? So that's our food web. And we can see there is a loss of usable energy at each step. So that is our second law of thermodynamics. So why do we need energy? So when we answer these sorts of questions in science, we want scientific concepts. We want reasoning. We don't want because we would die without it, okay? What are we using the energy for more specifically? So why is energy necessary for life, okay? Needed to function. In what way? What are we using it? Like, what kind of functions? So your cells can stay alive, but again, always dig deeper. And this is what you need to do when you're studying for tests, right? That's the surface. We need to explain the science behind it. 
Why do the cells need it to stay alive? What are the cells using that energy for? So example, reproduction. So reproduction of a whole species or of an individual cell. You need um, energy in order to make more cells so you can grow or for you, so you can repair. Those are good examples. Um, so there again, pretty much all things, but what are those all things? We need to be able to locate them. Oh, to use our five senses. That's an out of the box answer I haven't seen. Yeah, our senses, it's gonna require energy to send signals for cell communication, to send signals from your eye to your brain or from your brain to your hand. That's gonna take stimulus response. That's gonna require energy. Good one. For us to move, not just externally and manipulating our environment, like drinking my coffee, but also inside of our body. It takes energy to move food from our mouth to our stomach. So there's muscle contractions that are pushing that food through. That takes energy. To move molecules from one side of a membrane to another, our pumps, right? That takes energy. So good. We're getting to some specific things. And um, you can see where you can always go a little deeper, right? And when you're studying, you wanna try to go deeper. So what are our cells using energy for? For chemical reactions. Remember, we've studied how the enzymes decrease activation energy, but they don't get rid of it. So there's still energy needed for reactions to occur. Even to make energy, so ATP is our cell's energy, even to make that ATP molecule requires energy. To break down molecules, digestion, hydrolysis takes energy to be able to release the nutrients that are included in those macromolecules. Moving substances across a membrane, I mentioned the um, pumps, right? Like sodium potassium pump, but also endocytosis. That's a process that requires energy. Making more DNA and transferring it from one cell to another cell, that requires energy. So you should be able to come up with actual activities, cellular processes that require energy. That's part of our eight characteristics of living things. Okay, another question. How do we obtain energy? This is going to be an easy one for you guys. How do we obtain energy? I see a lot of eating or through food. Okay, so that's good. We obtain plants, here's a more thorough answer. We obtain plants, trees, and eating food. Consuming carbs, fats, proteins. I like that one because you're connecting to an earlier chapter, right? We talked about our four calories per gram, our nine calories per gram, good. Um, consuming food and breaking them down. So more specific, what are we doing with that food? Good, digestion. Standing in the sun is the best, just absorbing that energy. Um, okay, drinking an energy drink. So that would be part of obtaining food. So from these answers, does that make humans an autotroph or a heterotroph? What do you think? Can anybody shout it out for me? This slide might be out of order. Um, so law of entropy is the energy cannot be converted without the loss of usable energy. And this is what we were talking about. We can see that the sun is producing or giving this plant like a thousand joules of energy, but only 10 joules are being transferred to the animal that eats it, right? So there's a 10% rule. Only 10% of energy is transferred through the food chain. 90% of the energy is either used by the organism or lost as heat to the environment. That is a state concept, right? The whole state wants you to know that. <coughs> Sorry. So we lose a lot of usable energy in the form of heat, and that is our law of entropy, that you can't have an energy conversion without the loss of usable energy. I'm gonna skip this. He's reading a book and then the guy's like, oh, according to the second law of thermodynamics, the universe will consistently lose free energy through increasing entropy until eventually the universe experiences heat death. And the other kid's like, no, you spoiled the ending. So if you're a nerd, that's a fun little comic for you. The big idea is that energy is lost in the form of thermal energy. You need to know that.
Test question, exam question, likely. We have to rewrite our exam, but that's a big concept, okay? You'll see it again when we get into um, ecology. Okay, and interactive slides coming. Give me some examples of autotrophs and see how specific you can be, see how encompassing you can be. So um, to be encompassing, you wanna think about the different kingdoms or domains that exist. So what kind of examples can you come up with? Okay, so a lot of plants in general. Anybody give me a specific plant? Let's see. No specific plants. Algae, which belongs to the kingdom Protista, so you got outside of the plantae kingdom, so that's good. Fungi is a, is a common mistake, okay? So last hour also said fungi. Fungi don't produce their own food. We eat them, so it kind of seems like that, but they're actually decomposers. So they're breaking down like the tree bark. That's why we find them on tree bark or things in the soil or our bread, bread mold. Okay, so they're decomposers. They're not making their own food. They're te technically absorbing it from other, from other organisms. Bacteria, so you got out of um, our domain, went into the bacteria kingdom. Um, cyanobacteria would be a good example of a bacteria that makes its own um, food. Okay, so we don't seem to fall into that category. Earlier I asked you if we were autotrophs or heterotrophs. How about some um, types of autotrophs? So a lot of us recognize the photoautotroph, meaning you're using light energy, photons, okay? So you're using light to produce um, organic molecules. There's another form called chemoautotrophs. So like they're using carbon dioxide to synthesize, to make, to build organic molecules. So just like photoautotrophs, only instead of sunlight, they're using chemicals. So these, there's these bacteria that leave, live in the deep sea vents, right? Sun does not go that far, so they wouldn't be able to possibly photosynthesize. So they're using the CO2 that's in the water to create glucose, amino acids, nucleic acids, lipids, things like that, okay? So that's two types of autotrophs. We want to expand our schema and think of the chemoautotrophs. So heterotrophs, what are some examples of heterotrophs? Again, try to be a variety. Try to think of all your different kingdoms. The whole animal kingdom in general. Humans, dogs, lions, yes. Let's see, any out of the ordinaries. Birds and fish, insects. Herbivores and carnivores, good. So those that eat plants are herbivores. They're your primary consumers. Carnivores only eat animals. They're your tertiary consumers. Octopus and butterflies, that's an out of the box thought. Okay, fungi, that's where our fungi belong. They're heterotrophs. Many of our um, like amoebas, those protists, the protozoans have both. Um, the algae would be, um, an autotroph, but the amoeba would be a heterotroph. So getting into some other kingdoms. So define metabolism for me, please. What is your thought of metabolism? So between the autotrophs and the heterotrophs, we have a metabolic pathway. And I think we have a tendency to think rather narrowly about this word. So let's see what you can. Breaking down of food, a chemical process that occurs to maintain life, conversion of energies, breaking down in order to obtain energy. What's the speed one? The speed of energy goes through the body and uses it. Good. So you're not just breaking down, but you're using that energy for something, right? So we have a tendency to just think kind of narrowly as to how quickly our body um, breaks things down. And a lot of times we kind of characterize 
thin people as having a fast metabolism and heavier people as having a slow metabolism. But that's kind of a narrow thinking um, because it's what we do with fat when we break it down. So metabolism by definition is the sum total of all chemical reactions in your body. I often use this RxN, so start recognizing that it's a short way of writing reaction. So a metabolic pathway, which is what this chapter is about. A metabolic pathway is a series of chemical reactions. So we can talk photosynthesis, right? And we have, it looks like it's one reaction, but it's really not. It's several reactions all linked together. So the product of one becomes the reactant for the next, kind of like a series of um, enzyme related reactions and what one enzyme makes the next enzyme uses okay so a series of chemical reactions in which the product of one is the reactant of the other here's a good example photosynthesis and aerobic respiration I'm not sure why these are faded out but we can see photosynthesis makes glucose and respiration uses glucose so in our book this is our transition Section 8.1 is photosynthesis. Section 8.2 is respiration. So metabolic pathways are the sum total of reactions, the building up and the breaking down. So catabolic reactions, we've used this word before. It's the energy releasing reactions or it's the reactions that break down molecules. And remember, if you're breaking them, you're breaking bonds and that releases energy. So aerobic respiration is a catabolic reaction because it's breaking down glucose. I think of a catastrophe. A catastrophe kind of breaks down an area, right? Whatever it is that you're related to. So that helps me remember cata is destruction. Anabolic, people might use anabolic steroids to build muscles, right? So anabolic means to build or to synthesize. So photosynthesis is an anabolic reaction. It makes food and it makes energy. So it's building things. Metabolism couples anabolic and catabolic reactions. So I can see here the product of one is the reactant for the next. Okay, that's a coupled reaction within the metabolic pathways. So a lot of vocabulary we're covering. So what is your understanding already of photosynthesis? Remember, we're surfacing schema. It gives us something to anchor new knowledge to. So in order to learn about it in 8.2, we want to think about photosynthesis and what do I already know? So what is photosynthesis? What do you know about it? Go ahead. Turning sunlight into energy by autotrophs, the process that plants use to make energy the plants making food using energy, using light as a catalyst to make food and converting it into energy. Yes. So we really want to associate photosynthesis with building of the organic molecules, building of the food, building of the molecules that they will use to build themselves. Um, Cellular respiration is the creation of the energy itself, right? So associate photosynthesis with synthesizing macromolecules rather than synthesizing energy, okay? We're, we're going to harness the energy in organic molecules that can later be used to release energy, okay? So 8.1, um, thermodynamics 8.2 you're going to read about um, in the second hour and you're going to take notes on that that is going to be photosynthesis so you're going to be looking at processes examples how they're connected what is cellular respiration cellular respiration is 8.3 for us what is your understanding of cellular respiration the process is definitely part of homeostasis I see some people related to breathing so we think of respiring air in and out of our bodies, but what does it mean for a cell to breathe? So I see some of you are, are connecting it with breathing within a cell. So by that, do you mean it's taking in oxygen and getting rid of CO2? Some of you are associating it with energy. So the process cells convert sugar to energy. And when you get to AT, at, um, when you get to AP bio, we'll extend that to other molecules as well, but we'll generalize with sugar right now. 
Okay, so reaction to convert chemicals to ATP, good. So organic molecules being converted to ATP. So here's our two reactions um, and connecting them to earlier words. Photosynthesis is an anabolic reaction, meaning it's, it's synthesizing. Basically, it's taking the sun's light energy and it's converting it into another chemical energy. Okay, so we'll call that chemical energy A. I'm giving them letters so that you can see the connection between these two processes. So chemical A is produced during photosynthesis and it's used in cellular respiration. So cellular respiration is a catabolic reaction, meaning it breaks things down, okay? It takes that chemical that you have here and it converts it into chemical B. So wait, you're taking a chemical energy and you're converting it into a different chemical energy, right? So you're just gonna rearrange molecules basically rearrange atoms within molecules, I should say. So now chemical B, what is the end product? We are back to the beginning of our lecture. So we've created ATP, so that end product is ATP. We saw a little video clip about it, or you listened to one anyways. <laughs> Adenine triphosphate, so you have the nucleic acid or nucleotide, adenine nitrogen base, ribose sugar, and three phosphates. We learned we can break that last bond to release energy for the cell to use, okay? You should know for the test, you should know what ATP stands for. Recognize the name, adenosine triphosphate. You should know this quote unquote energy currency of the cell. It's commonly referred to as the energy currency of the cell, meaning it's what the cells use for energy. They can't use straight up glucose. They have to produce ATP from that glucose in order for cells to use it. So you're fixing it into a usable form. And we saw that in our connection to the last chapter. So when we broke off a phosphate from ATP, when we talked about the sodium potassium pump, it gave the energy to the pump to change shape. And when it changes shape, it's able to bind molecules and move molecules. So this process required energy in order to move molecules against their gradient. So when we say, what do cells use energy for? Here you have one very specific example, okay? So we just made a complete circle from beginning to end. What questions do you have? Okay, our second item on our turn-in list, we're going to stay in the same spot where it says thermodynamics, week 11, 8.1. You're gonna pull up the three column vocab list. All these words have been defined, okay? Try to put them in your own words. Find relevant pictures. Whenever we do these vocabularies, make sure that you are using the words in the context of the topic. When we did enzymes, a lot of people define substrates as dirt, the dirt that you find the bacteria in. That is not in the context of enzymes, right? So you missed an opportunity to learn that concept. So always define words in the concept they're being used, okay? So this is where I put you into your um, friend groups. It's an easy activity. You have time to be social, okay? Um, let me stop sharing if I can figure that out. Uh -uh -uh. Stop share. So, um, you know, you can get work done and still have time to break every now and then and socialize. Hey, what are you doing this weekend? Whatever. It's just a time to connect with each other. Um, when you're done, you're gonna turn this in. You'll have the ATP worksheet already done. If you're one of the five people that owe me a quiz, you're going to leave your breakout room after you've turned your work in and you're going to join me for the quiz. The rest of you, once you've turned this assignment in, you are free to go. So get that turned in and you can work on the um, note taking on your own time. Do it in the second hour of class or, you know, any time between now and Tuesday, okay? What questions do you have on agendas and expectations? 